Hi folks, good afternoon. I'm glad to be here online today. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, also, thank you for the organizers, Alessandra and Jerry, for letting me speak in here today. My name is Elias. I'm part of the Causal AI Lab at Columbia University. Um, I'd like to first apologize for my voice. I'm a little bit sick, um, but I think it will be everything will be fine. Uh, today, I'll be sharing uh, what I have been thinking in the last years about causal reinforcement learning of this or CRL. Um, this is a huge effort uh, in many fronts, and there are many folks helping to realize this vision. Uh, this is joint work with the causal AI lab and many collaborators. Uh, in particular, uh, I will discuss the work here today of the folks here that are on the line, Juan, Sanghak, John Z, uh, Yuda, Andrew, Dulliger, and Thomas. Um, and, uh, and I feel very happy and glad and lucky to be able to interact with this amazing team of collaborators. Um, to start, uh, I would like to, to share an even broader picture um, that is kind of from a 20,000 uh, feet view, which is the big picture I try to realize in my lab in which cause our oil is apart. And I think it will help to understand the way that I think. Um, and if you are interested in joint effort or, or have questions or you want to exchange ideas about some of these topics, including cause RL, obviously, uh, uh, let me know since it's a really ambitious, I believe, picture. Um, and it's a generational effort. And uh, uh, my goal here is to convince you that those are important problems and um, offer you the opportunity to contribute, but also to ask help. Um, then the, the, I feel that the unique insight we leverage uh, here is quite simple uh, in the lab, uh, albeit, albeit powerful, namely that the reality can be decomposed uh, in terms of the causal mechanisms, uh, which you call a structural causal model. Um, despite the fact that they are not these, they are not always uh, observables. Um, uh, and what is important about systems like that, that they exhibit a feature, or they have a characteristic called autonomy or modularity. You can fi find in many literature, uh, types of literatures, like in philosophy, economics, and so on, discussions about this feature, which will buy us a lot of power in general AI, uh, machine learning, the data science. We'll follow this picture that, uh, again, we follow this picture that reality exists um, and, the, it, it, and it is modular. And modular in the sense of it can de de be decomposed as a collection of causal mechanisms. I'll try to make this concrete during the talk. Um, the note that I put here, the structure of DNA on purpose, this was to, uh, this was to convey the point that this is like, it's, uh, it's the uh, blueprint of the underlying reality of the underlying system. I usually, personal note here, but I usually joke or partially joke with Yuda, Yuda Pro, um, that he discovered the structure of the DNA uh, for intelligence or for AI. And now we are trying to understand its consequence pretty much in the same way that we have uh, uh, Watson and Crick in 1953 in the Nature paper. Folks were doing molecular biology before for dozens of years or hundreds and uh, hundred, I should say, and so. And, um, and, uh, and, we just know modern molecular biology since uh, this discovery that is kind of an important framing about how to think about these issues. And we are still trying to understand these issues today. It's, it's not that this was done, 1953 was the beginning. And I think the beginning starts with the structural causal model underpinning as this collection of causal mechanisms underpinning the reality. From this view, we have two sides of the coin or two sides of the structural model, uh, we call SCM. I use this name many times, uh, and I will define it. Uh, first, we'd like to explain it, explain what's going on on the line, the system, um, which is kind of the goal of science. We'd like to open nature's black box uh, and explain how things work or how it could be understood um, in terms of more elementary and interpretable components. Uh, there are books written about this topic. In causal inference, this word has very special meaning and formal meaning. It comes under the different tasks and has the rubric such as effect uh, identification and decomposition, bias analysis and fairness, uh, robustness and generaliz generalizability to cite a few. Um, on the other hand, on the other side, you can say, Elias, I couldn't care less about uh, science or explaining something. I'm a pragmatist. I have my company to run. I want to improve the bottom line. 
I want to generate this uh, better society here for my population if I'm a policy maker and I just want to decide and, and improve something then um, this is the other perspective you could ignore the number one and think about decision making uh, the, the task here is how to learn to, how to intervene in a population or, or a system using data that is never a perfect match for this population. In machine learning, this comes under the rubric of reinforcement learning as a sequential decision-making center. In the sciences, you can have other names such as uh, randomized controlled trial uh, that is used in the health sciences and so on. For sure, there is some, inter there is some, inter there is some interaction between them. Um, if you understand more about the system, um, usually this would mean that we can be more surgical, swift, precise, and uh, uh, or accurate, I should say, and, and to bring about the change that we want. It could be social, it could be economical, and so on. Um, on the other hand, we can, if you just if you if you have some, even if you have low understanding, but we we have decision making or interventional capability, uh, we can intervene in the system. We can shake things up, shake things up. And if you are careful about that, about how deliberate you are, you can learn about the system. The, the, this is, after all, even in, on the science side, this is how we do. We can isolate in a careful way. We can discuss how to do that. But we isolate the system in some way such that we have this capability. We will be able to discover something. But it's also through the idea of, of, of experiments. Um, now, this is kind of more theoretical part. We can be trying to do try to be more, uh, there's also the implications of that. Um, we are interested about applications, uh, education and software. Um, in terms of uh, applications, there are kind of two big big buckets, I would say, that are not, are not this is not a partition. Um, uh, on the left side, we have data science. We're trying to do principal inferences from large data collections. And what I mean by principal, we would like to be able to stamp, have this stamp saying scientific, and we could discuss what scientific means um, uh, in the context. And on the other hand, you have the problem of AI uh, that we're trying to learn uh, principles uh, and tools for designing robust and adaptable learning systems. Um, this will be kind of the, the topic here today. Uh, we are focused on AI machine learning and in particular uh, in the reinforcement learning problem. Today I'll be talking about causal, uh, causal RL um, in particular. Then the the first question is like, what is causal RL? Uh, and to answer uh, these questions, I'd like to, 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 to make two observations. First, that reinforcement learning is quite awesome at handle, handling simple complex, complexity and also the credit assignment problem, given that we have this kind of delayed rewards that you take action now and something will just come up, uh, have this kind of long, uh, uh, time trajectories and the delay will come uh, pre pretty late or, 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 or very far from now. Um, then I, I think this is where it shines through. Um, and on the other hand, we know that causal inference is pretty great or awesome as well in leveraging structural invariances across settings, conditions, and environments. Maybe there is a word missing here, environments. Um, then uh, this, this, those are two disciplines that kind of evolved independent, virtually independently, very clear interactions of, of, of cross uh, development. Um, and the, ob the obvious question here is, can we, can, we, can we have the best of both worlds? I'll be upfront and say yes, uh, given that I'm enthusiastic about the, the, the topic. And the question is how, obviously, and the solution is very simple, simple equation, Cause RL is equal to CI causal inference plus RL enforcement learning. Um, it sounds like a joke, so supposedly, but that's uh, the fact. Uh, more, more, more seriously, um, what we are trying to do, or, or our goal, um, is to provide or to develop in reality a cohesive framework that takes takes the advantages of the capabilities of both formalisms into account. And I would say from first principles, we don't want you to, to have a hack here. They're the best uh, machine learning uh, AI community here in the world. Then from first principles, uh, such that or so as to allow us to develop the, dash, the next generation of AI systems. That's quite ambitious goal. Um, for sure, you have um, 
people in uh, um, there is a whole spectrum here I have been giving not as, exactly this talk but variations and about the particular tasks and we got uh, we have the spectrum but it oscillates between a lot of excitement say wow that's pretty cool usually from the younger people um, and, uh, um, and, and for our spectrum but people like wow this is when, once they understand they say wow this is exactly what we need and uh, how can you happen uh, help and, and, and let's let's try to realize this goal on the other hand you have the people that is more some type of resistance from both sides from the ci side and from the rl side um, uh, some people can be more conservative usually my experience because they are not understanding what the other person on the other side is is saying um, it, it's obvious as well usually you get resistance for uh, uh, as max planck says uh, science progresses from funeral uh, to funeral um, but I, I, I would say that the goal here of the tutorial is to, to try to bridge this gap and offer this uh, common language that we can understand uh, what are the challenges or what are the new challenges and what we are trying to accomplish. Then, um, then the outline here in order to realize this vision, uh, the outline of the talk will be I will try to ground the equation that I gave before. Um, and here is the outline. I will first start with foundations of CRL, of causal reinforcement learning. I will give an introduction to structural causal models, SCMs, um, the pearl causal hierarchy, the PCH, I'll explain what this means, or the ladder of causation, as it's called, and I'll, I'll ground uh, uh, how these things connect to a result called causal hierarchy theorem, CHT. Uh, a, a partial joke with the CLT, uh, I think it plays similar important central role to causal inference. Those, this is kind of basic fundamental material, then, um, we will try to, to understand the current methods in RL and CI through this lens, through the CRL lens that we're trying to develop. Um, then the, this is the first part. It, it will be abstract in some way, but completely necessary in order to understand what are the new challenges and opportunities uh, of causal RL, of, causal, of CRL. Um, I will roughly try to do uh, 60 minutes each. Um, they asked me to do 30, 30, uh, 30 times four. Um, I, I think it fits more natural or naturally, and, and, and they said it's totally fine. Um, I appreciate uh, uh, Alessandra and Jerry. Um, I, I'll do 60 60, um, approximately. approximately. Um, now, the, the goal here, one, one thing I'll say the goal is to introduce the main ideas, principles, and tasks. As I said, not focus on the implementation the details. Um, the, the, as I mentioned, just said, having think about this issue for some time, visit the different places. My understanding is like people is talking over each other. Then the idea is let's try to ground what are the, the foundations, what are the, the principles, and what is really the task that we're solving. And then the rest will follow. It may take one month, two months, six months, maybe one year as some of the theorems and papers or more that we're working, but eventually to follow from these basic principles. Now, for sure, you can get the details or, or much more of details in the in these um, in these papers. This is kind of spread out throughout the literature since I started thinking around 14, 15 uh, about this problem. There is a new CRL uh, survey that is putting this idea together that is coming out soon. I'll make it available in this URL, uh, crl.causeoi.net. Um, um, the, the, the survey is not out, but maybe when you are watching this, video it will be out um they but i'll put his sources there now let's let me start trying to let's start from the rl uh, side and let's uh, uh evolve from there um i'll try to understand what is the subtlety this is kind of textbook like definition of of rl <clears throat> there's a goal-oriented learning how to maximize a numerical reward signal we are learning about, from, and while interacting with an external environment. And it's adaptive. There's an adaptive nature that each action is tailored from an evolving set of covariates, with the features and the action's history. Depending on what we're observing now and how these things are changing and what we did in the past, uh, we'll be adaptively changing things. Um, the, oops, the note here that is these components we are learning from interactions. This, is, I think, is something important. There is the notion of goal. We are trying to achieve something. Uh, there is the notion of environment. We have the external environment. Then it means that you cut a line and there is something external and something that is not external. 
and there is the need to decide what to do. It's a learning problem without the full specification of the system. We are not doing planning, um, but most of the many problems that I, I will talk here also, even if you're doing plan, planning, they will appear. But I, I will try to emphasize other, uh, this other aspect today. Um, now, with this textbook definition, there is, this is the textbook picture. If you're teaching the RRL 101, in the first 10 minutes, this is the kind of picture that you give, or a variation of that. Um, the, the, we have the agent uh, on the left side. And the agent in reality is something that is parameterized. Then you have this collection of parameters theta. Uh, and on the right hand side, you have the environment. Then they have we are interacting with the external environment. And then it means that there is the agent. Now the agent has is perceiving. Then there is this thing called the context of states, some type of stimuli that comes in. And then the agent does some type of processing and decides to do something and commits to this action. It do, do the variable, let's say x is equal to some, some value x. And then the environment gets gives it back uh, uh, the reward about what's the effect of the action. The environment is the one that is evaluating. Oh, now here it just receives the feedback in the forms of rewards. Um, the agent's utility is defined as a reward function. Um, and the goal here is much to learn how to act so as to maximize some expected utility or expected rewards. Um, the general idea here is like a unifying team that we have in AI um that is the we would like to develop rational agents and we have this link that's a, a classic result about uh, uh rationality and maximizing expected utility um or, or maximize expected rewards uh, and with their utilities um the the now that's good <clears throat> now <clears throat> Um, it's late here at the moment, but I'm, oops. Um, now I was thinking about how, how to make the smallest possible change in this textbook figure so that I could convey, um, what I believe CRL is about. Um, and, uh, this is the picture that I could come up with. Um, in the left side, now we have the agent, sorry, let's start with the right. In the right side, we have the, the environment. But the environment here is uh, given by something called this structural causal model. The environment is this collection of causal mechanisms that I will define in one second. In the left-hand side, we have the agent. And the agent is this collection of parameter thetas, but now we have the causal graph. That will be defined as well formally. And also in the picture, I, I usually think that I don't like the word. Uh, I think it's overloaded. Uh, um, the the I, I think the best word here is like there are different types of interactions uh perhaps they can passively be being connected with the environment uh as we say there's observational uh, or through observations it can be actively interacting through interventions or it could be kind of doing uh some type of introspection or or retrospection or using its imagine imagination about this environment that's called counterfactuals uh, which I will develop here soon. Now, just to just to make clear what I said, I like to be as crisp as I can. The two key observations, this is all what I said that I want to add to the picture. Number one, if you are trying to move RL to CRL. Number one, the environment and the agent will be tied to tied through the pair SCMM and causal graph G. SCM in the side and the environmental side causal graph in the in the agent's mind. Number two, we we'll define different types of actions, of interactions, which we we'll try to avoid ambiguity, that will be given by this PCH, by the pro-causal hierarchy, that again, I will define for only one second. But that's at least the picture that I would like to, you to have so far. Two, two things, two bullets, the pair SCM um, and graph G, and the other one is the PCH is mediating there about how these things interact. Um, oh, I, uh, I forgot about this one. Let's define and understand number one, that is the pair M and G. Number two, that is the PCH. Now, starting with structural causal model and causal graphs, let's get into it. Um, I'd like to start with the, the some kind of intuition behind what is a structural causal model that we are trying to represent a data generating model. There are different types of generative models. 
uh, of the environment or, or nature or so on. There are uh, uh, different types of generative models. This special one, we'll talk one and we define semantics and so, but it's a process-based approach. We'll try to give an example in the, in the, in the context of drug, assuming that we are trying to relate or to understand the relationship between drug uh, consumption or intake and headache. Now here we have the, the process-based approach in which drug is a function or uh, there is this mechanism that is giving uh, value to the drug. Then this mechanism F sub D take as input the age of the person, depending on the age group, people is taking drug in different ways, the different propensities to take drug. And also there is this variable U sub D, U of unobserved. And this is all other variables in the universe that generates direct variations to the variable drug that are not age. Second mechanism, mechanism of the variable headache. Headache is a function of, or gets its value based on whether the person got the drug or not, depending on the age of the person, and U sub H. What is U sub H? U sub H are all possible variables in the universe that are not drug and age. Now, there is also a graphical, you could have a graphical counterpart of that. This is the graph that we have. Um, the, for, for simplicity here, instead of drug, headache, and uh, uh, age, I'm calling uh, X, Y, Z. Just to make it interchangeable, but I'll start to from this specific name. Um, the, the, um, and on purpose here, I didn't pick an example in robotics or some other team, uh, because I'm trying to say that CRL is much more general than that, uh, meaning we don't need to attach robotics, even though there is awesome stuff going on, including people that is thinking or, or, or doing causal stuff or starting to do causal stuff. But I, I, I would like to be less committal. But uh, soon this will be just an action, this will be outcome, and this will be a set of covariance. Now, what is the meaning of this? Here we have the, the start to having the processes that are related to this call, that are these causal mechanisms in coding reality. And here we have a causal graph. What is the causal graph? The mean is this is not a base net, this is not an MRF, this is not any other model. This is a causal graph. What is the meaning or the semantics of the causal graph? The arrows here, if the variable participates in the mechanism of the other, like, oh, age participates or is, uh, gives values to headache through this F sub H, then you add the arrow from H uh, to headache, from Z to Y. If drug participates in the in the mechanism of headache, then you add the arrow from drug to headache. If age participates in the mechanism of uh, drug F sub D, then you add uh, from Z to X. That's the, the this is a encoder. There's some type of loss of information. Note here, by the way, one thing. Sorry, one thing that I didn't say. This F sub D here could be a crazy function. It could be a a, a linear function that is very easy to think about. Or it could be a completely crazy one, even that uh, exhibit, I don't know, uh, chaotic behaviors, or it could be complete anything. I'm not instantiated here in the slide. I'm trying to leave it open to any possible function uh, in the universe. While here, but is it, it is instantiated in the particular problem. While here, we don't have clue of the functions. We are kind of have some type of coarsening here. But anyhow, from a process that is going on through in this way, we can sample from it and we get what is a probability distribution. We got data. Uh, let's say that we get a probability distribution, P of Z. Uh, there is some discussion, but I will skip about the P and the P hat. I'm assuming uh, I, I'll get back to that at some point, uh, I, I believe. Um, the, the, we can sample from the process that is in the left side, uh, which gives us the, uh, gives rise to this observational distribution among the observables P of Z, X, and Y. Now, we are here today, not that we, and we can do statistics or some type of AI machine learning on top of that. But we are here today because we are trying to understand about what the heck is causality and uh, how this relates to interventions or to reinforcement learning. Now, the idea of interventions is like what, how the system will react when it in the, in the, undergoes some change. And what's the change here? The change is like, the, the, for example, we come from outside as an external, uh, 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 external agent, or an agent, I should say, and we decide to change the models operandi about how the drugs are being uh, assigned, and now we just 
make drug is equal to yes, then you decide to submit your population to be, have access to this drug. Let's say that is a vaccine to the coronavirus. And this is the operation here. You are replacing or rewriting the original mechanism with, the, with some other, in this case, is a constant yes. What happens when you do this intervention? The mechanism of the other variables, given that you just did the intervention on drug, remains invariant. That's where we start getting this autonomy or modularity. Now, observation here, I'm just talking about the intervention, yes, but this, when you are running a randomized control stu uh, study, there is some kind of random coin there that is deciding the value of the drug. Still, it is not the same mechanism as people get the drug usually, but it's a, 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 it's a different one. It's randomized, but it's a different one. It's not a constant, but it's a different one than F sub D. You can have more sophisticated policies as you would be interested that is a pie of age. Depending on the age group, we decide to give drug with a different uh, uh, likelihood or different probability. Then that is different, let's say, about how people are choosing by themselves the drug. This is F sub D. There is a different argument and so on. Then... Um, there is some subtleties about when you have conditional policies, not for our discussion here. You can check this beautiful work by uh, Juan uh, uh, with me about some of these subtleties, and, and um, I think that's enough. Uh, here, at least for the sake of argument, everything will be fine if I just put the yes here in order I can round things up. Now, um, there is also the graphical counterpart of this, uh, uh, of this operation that is happening in the mechanism level. And here, as you can think, uh, the Z is no longer, uh, the F sub D is no longer active, then Z no longer affect X. Then there is just a yes there. Then you kind of, this is where the, 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 the error removal uh, appears. Oops. Um, the, here, there is an alternative notation for that. Um, for the, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, for sure, you can sample from a distribution like that. Uh, if you're able to contrive a situation in the world in which you'll be like that, like the, the picture in the right side bottom, now you can sample from this process. And this gives rise to something called the, the experimental or the interventional distribution P of Z, uh, uh, P of Z comma Y given do X is equal to yes. Um, you also can have alternative notation that if P of Z sub X is equal to yes, Y sub X is equal to yes. I use this other type of counterfactuals and I'll mention later on. Um, uh, we will stick with the new notation for now. Now, the, the again, uh, as I mentioned before, alluded to before, usually we are talking about the drug will be in general any decision, the outcome will be, uh, Y will be any outcome that could be the reward. Uh, and the Z will be uh, the set of features. And I use these terms uh, consistent with the notation that we have in causal inference. Um, now, challenge here is that, uh, which I'll be back many times, usually you don't observe these mechanisms. Uh, sometimes you can observe the causal graph that is already discoursing, and many times you cannot do the intervention. Then usually we have data that is coming from the left-hand side, and we are trying to do the inference uh, in the right-hand side, as if you have done the intervention without doing it. That's a classic. Then from seeing the system passively, we would like to make a statement as if you are doing the intervention in the system. If you are able to do this type of very hard type of prediction of the effects of our interventions, then you can be surgical and eventually you can avoid ex uh, experimentation, side effects, it can be safer and so on. I'll come back to that uh, again. Now, let me just try to generalize this idea of interventions and equations or, or mechanisms describing some type of mechanics uh, and define a little bit more formally a structural causal model, which is a tuple with four components, V, U, F, and P of U. Uh, the set V is the set of endogenous endophromicide, endogenous variables or observable variables, V1, V2, Vn. In this case, in the previous example, V1 could be D, the drug, and V2 could be the... Uh, if you have headache or not, uh, and V3 could be the age. We also have the set U, that is the set of exo outside exogenous variables in the systems. U was unobserved, and we have many of those. 
We have a, a collection of mechanisms, F, big F, uh, that are functions that determine the value of the endogenous variables. Variable. For each endogenous VI, you have this function FI that listens, as Holland is used a, a, a metaphor in the book of Y, but in general, um, that listens to the PAI, a set of observable variables called parents, and the set of UI called exogenous variables. Uh, so far as describing essentially uh, Newtonian physics or some kind of deterministic system, um, <coughs> the, the, uh, whenever you decide to have a cut and you put some variables outside and you decide to analyze others like V, uh, there is some uncertainty about what's going on in the description out, outside the box, outside the model, that then there is a probability distribution P of U that we're sprinkling there, summarizing the kind of initial conditions of the state of the universe outside. Then this is what we have. It turns out that systems like that admits or has an axiomatic characterization that is well understood by uh, in this work by Halpern uh, in 98 and another work by Gallus and Pro. Uh, Halpern's logician in, um, in Cornell is uh, doing kind of awesome work and Gallus was uh, Yuda's student um, working with in, the, in this particular problem. Um, the well, essentially any any uh, result that you derive today can be traced back to this one if you go to, you want to go to assembly code. Um, I'm more interested at least for now in the in the following observation. Once you have SCMM, a specific instantiated of this object, this implies this thing that we are calling the pro causal hierarchy or what is called the PCH. Usually causal hierarchy I call pro causal hierarchy uh, in honor of him. Um, now I would like to understand a little bit more or open up the box uh, about the PCH. Uh, for the sake of context, this is the, the, the main metaphor, the main topic, I would say, of the Book of Y, if, uh, if you read. It was also called that the ladder of causation. Um, I think it's in chapter two, if my memory is right. Um, uh, as I said, we used, we used to call in the lab the causal hierarchy um, uh, and, and this is different names. This will help to ground our discussion. Don't forget the picture that we had before in which we have this, I promise, two, three, three, build, three building blocks. The connection between G and M, I am talk abstractly and give the math what they mean. Um, the, that G is a coarsening of M. Uh, and, and now I also said that uh, the, the point number two was about these different, not actions, but the different types of interactions which is given by the PCH, in which I would like to talk a little bit more. If you haven't read the book, um, this is just a review. Uh, it, it will be OK. Um, the, if you haven't read the book, sorry, if you did read the book, that's fine. That's great. I will try to review and ground in the way that I'm thinking about it, that I'm not exactly the same. It's, it's mathematically the same. Uh, or, um, and if you haven't read the book, that's fine. Uh, you can read the book. It's kind of a very good book. Uh, entertaining and, and good and um, ni nicely done, um, but it will be okay that I'll give you the basics here. Now, what is this PCH, Elias, that we're talking a lot? Please tell me. Um, I, I'll describe this level, typical the, a symbol, typical activity, typical question and example. The first layer that we have is L1, uh, that is called, uh, in the book is called rung. There's different rungs. It's informal for the book usually call layers. Um, the first layer is called associational, L1. Uh, symbolically is described by words like P of Y given X as we have there. Um, is related to the activity of seeing. Uh, how would uh, uh, seeing X is equal to X change my belief in the variable Y? Uh, what does a symptom tell us about the disease? Um, if you want to find a counterpart in modern machine learning, uh, this is related to studied uh, for many years in, in, in statistics and in other fields, uh, but much uh, or very successful in machine learning. Uh, this comes under the rubric of supervised or unsupervised learning. Uh, there is many formalism, uh, a huge amount of theory about how to evaluate expressions like that, P of Y given X, uh, such as decision trees, a long time, base nets, regression, hierarchical models, neural nets. Um, Challenge here, or why you have been studying this problem for a long time, I get this question. It's like uh, nowadays you operate with this Y given X. X is the set of features and Y is the label, for example. But this can be in the order of 
hundreds of thousand dimensions of millions even nowadays that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm not, uh, then this is really, really difficult, uh, both in terms of computational complexity and in terms of sample complexity, because you don't have all the combinations. Then, um, uh, it, it, whatever, this, this is the reason, uh, this is such a challenging problem. Now, on the other hand, you have a, a, another layer that is called the interventional layer, L2. Uh, symbolically, you, you write like that, P of Y given do X, given that you observe C, uh, or context or state, is related to the activity of doing. Uh, what if I do X? Uh, will, what if I take the aspirin? Will my headache be cured? Um, that's nice. Uh, in machine learning, as you can hint, this is very related to the problem of uh, reinforcement learning. Um, that is why we are here today. Uh, there's different formalisms that can handle that. I'm just listing some of them. A causal based net, a co CBN is called a MDP, a Markov decision process, and there are others. Now we have the third layer, that is the counterfactual layer. I will skip here the, the symbol for one second, L3. Uh, is related to this activity on imagination, introspection, retrospection, or uh, why type of questions. Uh, what if I had acted differently? Uh, was it the aspirin that uh, cured uh, my headache? Now, I, I, I took, let's say, now let's try to parse here. I took the aspirin, that is X prime, and now I'm cured. And I'm wondering, would I be sick? That is why, had I not taken the aspirin, that is X. Then you have this counter, the factual world. In the factual world, I did take it, and I'm okay now. Not really, I'm a, oh, excuse me, I'm a little bit sick. But I'm okay now, let's say. X prime is took it, took the drug, and Y prime is, um, I'm okay. And I'm wondering what would have happened had I not taken it. Then it's a heavy load here. There's no counterpart, really, uh, in the machine learning literature. Uh, this is model, uh, uh, and you can ask me questions, even though there are claims here and there, but we can have a discussion, but uh, roughly there is, there is no, uh, not well studied yet. Um, the, there is huge amount of work in the, in the CI field about that, um, but still much more to be done. Uh, the formalism that we have for this kind of uh, problems is a structural model. Now, I would like to, to make a note here um, about uh, why is this a hierarchy? And the hierarchy is, means that there is something about um, uh, this is if you keep going up in the hierarchy, this is flipped. But if you go from L1 to L2, L3, this is from the last detail from something. This is a correlation between X and Y that we are trying to leverage here between the image that we are trying to pick up the signals with the some outcome of some label to be more detailed about the counterfactual. Uh, that is a very detailed description of the system. Um, it may sound a little bit, but I would say, it may sound a little bit abstract for now. Uh, stay with me. Don't be nervous uh, that I will use examples of layer three later on. But I think we can get the feeling that this is kind of different task already about this collision of the worlds. And this is, by the way, very related to the problems of um, uh, um, blame and responsibility, credit assignment, uh, fairness, interpretability, all falls there in L3. Uh, it's still not explored. In other words, I think you should study it. Um, but anyhow, it forms a hierarchy in this, sen in, in this sense, and I would like to ground a little bit in terms of the amount of information that we have about the environment, of the true environment, the true causal mechanism. Then try to expand or ground, ground a little bit, given the, uh, uh, my expectation here that we understand roughly that those are different uh, types of things. Um, and I would like to explain a little bit more this containment that we have, what we call the CHT, as a partial joke, as I think I already mentioned about the CLT, um, which is a central element in the causal uh, inference literature. It's believed to hold, by the way, I should mention historically, for a long time by folks such as Yuda, Yuda Pro himself, me, uh, one of the reasons uh, I'm very excited even came to the US because of a result like that. Uh, it was just proven in generality recently. Um, let, me, let me read it here. Given that SCMM implies the PCH, and we can show that or defines or induces the PCH, we can show the following result. Um, with CHT, we respect to the bag measure over some type of technical conditions here over the SCMs, the subset in which any PCH collapse, I quoted here because I didn't define, uh, is measure zero. 
let me try to exp uh, let me do try to put with words in other words for almost any SCM that you could get usually you don't know which one is your environment this is your unobserved but for almost any SCM that you get the PCH doesn't collapse in the sense that layers of the hierarchy remains distinct then you don't have this type of situation that maybe you do some may, may, the idea is like um, you have these notions of observations and notions of interventions it seems to be different if you read the book of wire if you think about that or about imagination as well maybe in some world they could be the same we just don't know how to reduce one to the other um here um, um in some way are saying no it's not true uh it, it one is strictly more powerful than the other then there is things that statements uh, a better way to say a statement about the world that l2 is making that l1 is doesn't know about it or under specifies let me continue and try to ground uh corollary here to answer questions at layer i uh, uh about a certain type of interaction one needs knowledge from layer i or above let me um, try to understand, uh, try to connect here what we're saying. I said the following, each SCM M that we, is nicely shown here uh, induces this hierarchy that is these different types of interaction with different notions in the world about observing, about intervening, and about thinking and so on. Now, uh, that's all good and nice and sounds beautiful. Um, the, then the question here is like, uh, why is this non-trivial then? Why, why is causal inference non-trivial? I can just compute everything from the SM that I have. And one of the most common questions, by the way, that I get. Is that, but it's very interesting thought or a dream, I would say, because in fact, this is not true. Things are not so easy. Unfortunately, exactly because the, the as I wrote here in the title, the SM, SMs are almost never observable. Now, even though, this is important, even though there is a SM there, there is a collection of mechanisms there, we don't fully observe it. We, we just observe some fragments eventually that is in the layers. Not all in general. Now, I should, I, I, I have to say here, this is almost never. We almost, as the title say here, SM is almost, almost never observable. For sure, there is a, a, exceptions, such as in physics, in chemistry, sometimes in biology. The various science in these fields is trying to learn about this mechanism. Then they are kind of zooming in, in a very detailed level, um, they, sometimes it takes 100 years or 250 to move from one theory of physics to another. Um, but in reality, they are they are serious, and they and this is the kind of phenomena uh, uh, they are analyzing some type of phenomena that allows them to do that in some way. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's enough for now. But I, but I would argue that uh, most of the settings that we are interested in embedding AI and in which humans are involved involved. It's practically impo impossible uh, to get the description of the SCM. Um, the hum humans are in the loop, it's, they are unpredictable. There is some kind of chaotic component there. Uh, and essentially the problem is the complex phenomena is involved. Then, uh, uh, and there are social interactions and there are many other types of interactions that there is no way that we can isolate the system in some way that things are so clean. Um, the, the, then this is a first world citizen here. We are acknowledging that we cannot get that. This is an important uh, point. Now, what's the deal, Elias? Then what are you talking? I'm talking that suppose that we have an agent that is embedded in this environment and the agent keeps some time observing what's going on in the world. Then it's getting this layer one type of data through observations. Again, uh, this is similar to my picture before. I'm just grounded with the PCH. The agent is getting observations, and now the agents want to infer about what they should do in the system. Um, now, is it possible to use the data from this layer one in order to make a statement about layer two? Now, um, in, unfortunately, the answer is no. I put a, a bar there. Why? We just discussed. This is the CHT. CHT is saying that we cannot move across the layers because there is more information. Layer one under the term is layer two. That's the theorem. Then not possible. Now the question here is like, I say, given, I mentioned, there is an, given the unobservability of the SCM, together with the CHT, it seems that not inf no inference is possible within this uh, PCH, 
we cannot get any information here in the PCH, given that I cannot observe this guy, and we have this uh, uh, CHT proved. Then the question is, what can you do? This is kind of strong negative result. And the idea is like, this is the very motivation why you like to, to study something about the SCM. And these things is what we call these structural constraints. And a graph is nothing more than a collection of structural constraints. Um, there are different classes of graphs, I would say, or different ways of eliciting, of getting this one. Um, I'll just list the, the common ones. The first one is to use templates. That is many times implicit in the literature. But we have a multi-arm bandit, or we have an MDP, uh, or we have a POMDP. This is a template. Even though people are thinking algorithmically, if you learn the, open the open up the algorithm, you are able to extract the graph. That is exactly the assumptions that they are making about the environment. Uh, and have been popping out there, papers here and there doing that. But uh, it's a template. Uh, we can do knowledge engineering that maybe you have some extra information about the environment. I don't know. In economics, people is able to elicit instrumental variables. Then perhaps you can leverage uh, uh, you, you can leverage that it imposes some type of constraints in the city. It is encoding some type of constraints about the underlying uh, SCM. Um, for sure, number two is more general than one, because whatever one is just whatever. It's just that we would like to believe that the word conform is kind of cookie cutter, um, uh, cut, cutter uh, in some sense. But um, anyhow, then there is the third one. That if you want to test your model, or even if you want to learn from scratch, if you want to build a baby, baby Einstein, that you want to keep evolving, don't you want to hard code the code there. Uh, this is called the causal discovery. Um, the, um, in other words, that's kind of the motivation. Let me try to put the pieces together, uh, because there are many conceptual blocks here that I, I, I mentioned, uh, and I think it's uh, good uh, to summarize. Um, the environment or the mechanisms uh, can be modeled as an SCM. The SMM, that is the specific environment, eventually, that you're embedding in your system is rarely observable. Uh, still, each SCMM can be probed through qualitatively different types uh, of interactions or distributions, that is the PCH, observations, interventions, and counterfactuals. And not only probe, but the types of interactions, but also modes of reasoning. I'll defer, but uh, there is this way of interacting with the uh, with nature. Um, but now it comes the CHT that says that for almost n SCM, uh, lower layers, let's say layer Li, under determines higher layers, layer Li plus one uh, or above. These the limits or in some way constraints what an agent can infer based on the different types of inter interactions and data it has with the environment. For concreteness, I already give this example. From passively observing the environment that is all one type of data, it cannot infer how to act. From intervening in the environment, all possible interventions, and you do L2, L, L2 kind of data, it can't infer how things would have been uh, uh, had she acted uh, different. That is a L3 type of statement. Um, the, the, and I'll just give you the example. You can show that. Uh, then the causal graph, G, is a surrogate uh, of this uh, uh, underlying system. Uh, and in reality, of the structural invariances that I encode. The, the, the causal graph is a surrogate of the structural invariances that underlie the system, underline M. Um, now, uh, okay, that's good. I, I think we have the building blocks as promised. We have the pair M and G that is encoding the relationship between the environment and the agent. And now we have the PCH about how these guys interact or the types of modes of interactions that you could have. Um, it's still abstract, stay with me. Now I'd like to discuss um, the connection or how this allows us to interpret the methods that we have today in RL and in CI to what I'm calling the CRL uh, lens or so the machinery that we're developing just now. Now um, the goal, here's the deal. The goal that we have is learn a policy by A policy pi is such that a sequence of actions, when you apply this pi, with whatever argument, it returns action x1, x2, xn, that maximize some kind of reward e of y given do x um, of pi. Then I'm just saying here that the x, the, the way that you are picking the value of x is through pi. 
Pi is the one that determines that. This is the notation that I'm using. Um, there are different notations. Uh, and the argument here, I'm leaving unspecified, but it could be any type of argument. You can get the argument C, you can get the context, you can get the argument S, and so on. Now, <clears throat> the current strategies that uh, you found in the literature, um, the first one, I, and I'll just give you the map and I'll detail them. I'll give you three. The online type of learning, or li I like to call uh, interventional learning, the agent performs uh, experiments herself. The input of the systems is experiments on the form do x i y i. The goal is to learn the y given to x such that you like to evaluate that, some kind of average over that. <clears throat> the second mode of learning, the agent learns from the other agent's actions. Now, one agent is experiment itself, the other agent is learning from the other actions. Now we don't only have the experiments, but we have samples. Samples in the form do x i y i, we're still learning, trying to learn the y given to x. The third one, um, agents observe other agents acting. And you like to learn out from there. Um, here, the input are samples of x i y i. Note here that when I have samples and samples, but here we have xi, and here we have uh, 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 do xi. Here we have x, do xi, do xi, here we have experiments and samples. Now, it's subtle, the most common question is about the number two. One thing that I should mention, both of them are offline. The subtle here that we are trying to convey is that um, here, the key word is the agent is deliberate. We are learning from the other agent's action that was deliberate about how he decided to pick this variable do xi, this is why we are putting do, still samples because you are not the one that experiment. On the other hand, in the do calculus, you have samples and you have xi because you don't know the, the other keyword, the reasons that led the, the agent to pick this xi. Again, I, I, I go one by one, but here the first one essentially, we ignore whatever is there and just do the intervention. When we are trying to move from the from the actions of other agent to the action of me as an agent, and the last one we are just asking to whatever, we're just observing the person doing something that we have no idea if it's deliberate or not, maybe just casually, subconsciously, uh, even you, you have an example like that uh, in some task uh, later on, and we are trying to learn how to act from that. Now I'll go one by one a little bit slowly. Um, um, the oh this is just a bit of notation here that is do x do x to do x and cv to the do x let me try to ground a little bit more um online type of learning finding the x star is immediate once the y given do x is learned um because we can kind of essentially argue max it um challenge here is like uh, y given do x can be estimated through randomized experiments or adaptive strategies. You can use a UCB, you can use a, a Thompson sampling, you can use whatever you like to decide adaptively, uh, but that's the idea here of the online learning, just to cite two examples that are prominent, uh, or you can do experiments out of Fisher. Uh, the positive here is like, it is robust against unobserved confounders, that is variables that are affecting more than one observable. The negative experiments can be expensive or impossible to conduct or unethical, uh, hard to do experimentation with human subjects, or can lead to side effects, or may lead to the, the, to the, to, to the, the destruction of society because it can be harmful, yeah, it can be, can be evil eventually. Then all the times that you're doing these experiments online, this is what we're eventually getting. Um, here's the graph that you have. You have the word uh, uh, pre-randomization of whatever is going on here. You have some kind of decision X the outcome y, and then you have this unobserved confounder u that is both affecting x and y. Could be any variable in the universe uh, uh, here. And now we are we are saying that whatever I will forget about whatever is in the world, I will submit this system to this policy pi uh, that will pick up the value of x. And this is what online learning means. Um, this starts as I alluded, I think, but from Fisher to build, I think, is one of the uh, biggest insights. Uh, the, of the, the previous century uh, in the early uh, in the early 1900s about how to do that uh, that opened up the whole the whole uh, 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 I would say endeavor of causal inference uh, and reinforcement learning as well. Um, 
without knowing or that doing that explicitly. Now, this is the picture, the other way that I like to think about the picture. I just copy what we have before, but now I like to think in terms of the data. Whatever is going in the world before, I want to ignore, no data. I'll just submit the world to this policy pie, and now I start getting uh, samples that is this kind of uh, vertical lines here. Now, which means that eventually when I'm sampling here and getting X that is determined by pi, I'll eventually be able to get some type of Y given to X in relatives of average over Y, but that's fine. Um, then this is what is in the mind of the agent. Um, some kind of interesting results in our paper I sent out this year, but I'll leave you to, to think about. Um, the, the, now, um, I'd like to make a note here about the covariate specific cause or effect or the contextual setting or the stateful setting. Um, the model that I just gave, the kind of tall with X and Y and U, can be augmented to accommodate a set of observed covariates, also known as contexts or states. The U will be the set of remaining uh, unobserved confounders, the UCs. Then you could have the original UC that is my picture, but now you can get some of this U and pick up and put as being the C. That's totally possible. Uh, the goal here will be uh, somewhat analogous. We are trying to learn a conditional policy, learn a pi of C, so as to maximize the optimize based on the C specific cause or effect, P of Y given to X comma C. Now, why is this important? First, because usually you have context and usually you have uh, states, um, but also because it's very challenging. Uh, usually we have a high dimension of C um, uh, that could be one million dimension. We're talking about pixels or, or videos and so on. Um, here's an interesting connection that I, may, I like my animation here. Disney level, Pixar level, Pixar, uh, uh, maybe think that I'm available here in the market after this animation. Um, the, this was a joke. Um, but, but this is kind of flaming hot now that is like, um, given that we have the C that is super high dimension, even from the pixel level, uh, we would like to have some type of function approximation or some kind of dimensional islet reduction to be able to pick the decision X, to have this mapping from C or to S to X. Then deep learning or, or, or the, is just perfect for that. And deep RL is exactly leveraging this connection. Um, that's uh, a point. I'll be uh, uh, not talking about that here today. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I'll try to, to, I'll be humble. Some people think that it's not good when I say that, but in the sense of I'm not operating this level now. Um, if you're curious, you can ask me later. But here I'm trying to exhibit or to show these other dimensions of types of interactions. Then uh, I want to isolate the issues. Then uh, that's fine, but it could be compounded in, a, in, in the usual way that we have been doing. Um, they are not so usual, but uh, it's fine. Um, the second model, this is online learning. Now, the second one is the off-policy learning. Uh, y given to X can be estimated through experiments conducted by other agents and different policies. Uh, the positive here is like not, no experiments need to be conducted, which is kind of the dream, because we don't want to kill society or kill people or destroy society or do have these negative effects. Uh, sometimes it's not ethical to do experimentation for other reasons as well. Um, the, and it's costly as well. You do an experiment with, I don't know, a few hundred people and can cost uh, maybe five million bucks or so. Um, this is the pro, no no need. The con is that rely on two assumptions. A1, the same variables were randomized. And A2, the context needs to match across that. And let me show here the picture that this becomes clear. Note here that in the left side, we have an agent that went online let's say, and, 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 and conducting and, uh, with, this, with this policy pi prime that is deciding the value of x. Again, you can put a context C, it's like the same, but it's picking the value of x. Now we would like to, to, to speculate or to predict the effect of what would happen when you have this policy pi. Now the assumption that I'm saying, A1, same variables are in the scope of the policy, then pi prime is control x, Pi is control X as well. Then that's kosher. That's fine. Um, now the context needs to be the same. That is the need to match the C. Here is the same. The policy here at least C is equal to empty because it's an average over the U. And here C is equal to empty. Then that's fine. Then we can use a technique called IPW, for example, inverse probability weighting that allows us to move uh, the data that we collect from the policy prime 
in order to compute what will happen with the policy pi prime to get what will happen with policy pi. Let me give the same example on top here. I just want to ground with the picture that I usually like in terms of the uh, data. Here we have an agent that collected many, many data points following this policy pi prime. This is full of these uh, uh, vertical kind of lines. And now we have another agent that don't want to go to the environment and just want to know, can be the same agent another day, want to know what will be the effect of the policy pi. Then the idea is like, let's use this IPW. This is a formula here on one variation. How can you show that? That you are kind of use the inverse of the probability of what you did to kind of discount the effect and you multiply by the new probability. And then you can get uh, uh, whatever you have, uh, the effect of the new, the P pi of Y dux. Um, the, why, why is this interesting? Why people care about that? There are hundreds of papers written about that and non-trivial. Uh, the idea is like whenever you're in the contextual setting, you have this C here, again, you have the di dimensionality problem. And, uh, and you can be more statistical and try to do double robustness, or try to understand propensity score and things like that, or you can do machine learning and try to do a uh, dimensionality reduction, but still there is a, a lot of challenges or it's very tricky in the sense that the variance may blow up. It is an issue. Uh, this is off policy. It's still, no matter complexity, that's the summary of the picture. They, they, are, they are over the same action space and the, the same context. They have the same perception, um, which I think is very hard to hold, but I will come back in the second part on that. Uh, no two agents, I don't really have this sentence, or I don't know if I have this presentation, the second part, but no two agents are created equal. Even twin robots, you let them evolve, they start having different sensors, the actuators change a little bit, the way of the light, of the way that they perceive the world, and so on. Um, it's hard to hold, uh, but it, sometimes it holds as approximation. We will talk about that. Um, now we have the third modality here, that is the Gudu calculus learning. Why given do X can be estimated from non-experimental data, also called the natural regime or the behavior regime? Uh, the positive here is that estimation is feasible even when the context is unknown and the experimental variables do not match. match. In other words, the off-policy assumptions that we have before uh, are violated. Um, the, and you can ask me why I'm separating two and three personal preferences that I'm trying to distinguish the literature uh, and having a better classification. Both, again, both of them are off, off, offline and do calculus more generally, uh, because you take this type of assumptions as well. Um, but focus in a different part of the, part of the problem. Let's say, uh, when I started about what's the difference between our own, the focus is more about the invariances that are there. Uh, uh, let me continue, sorry, parenthesis. No. <clears throat> the, the negative here is like the results are contingent on the model. For weak models, the effect is not uniquely computable. Uh, uh, it is not ID. Possibly not ID. Now here is the model that we have. You can have the spirit in the left side. You can have the passive world. That is the the how route is going on. Note here that the U is still affecting X and Y, but perhaps you have another additional knowledge that the mechanism. There is a third variable Z, and the F of Z is is listening uh, uh, to the variable X, and the variable Y is no longer listening to us. X is not in the argument of Y, but uh, Z is in the argument of Y. They don't have this type of chain there. Then this is knowledge. This is structural knowledge. You don't know exactly what are the mechanisms, but this is creating some type of invariance that could be leverageable. Now you can do this do calculus inference, and you would like in the mind of the agent to know what is the P of Y given to X to follow this policy by here without doing the intervention, without doing the intervention. Um, the, there's kind of more details here. This is a well-studied uh, problem. Uh, uh, at least in, in, in causal inference, there's this survey uh, with me and Yuda in the proceeding of the National Academy uh, that I think is, uh, you, you, if you are interested in the problem. Um, um, this is the picture that we have before. Now, again, for thinking about this is before, uh, topologically or in terms of the invariances or the worlds that we want to talk about, this is in terms of the data. We have plenty of data here collected observationally, P of Z, X, and Y. We don't know if the guy did any intervention in this case. Ah, I forgot to say, in this case, clearly the assumption from the from the off policy is violated. Note here that the the A1 is, is the same. Um, the, the, or you don't even know in reality, but A2 is violated. 
because it's the same because we're talking about the action acts, which is the same, but um, uh, age two is violated because the first agent, uh, uh, the policy, the context of the policy is this variable U, while the second doesn't have access to the U because U is unobserved for the, the agent that us in reality. Then uh, there is a mismatch here that you already, you can try as you want and for sure you can get numbers doing the evaluation with the IPW, but the results are not true. It's not equal to the effect of the policy. Now we can run this do calculus inference engine and you have this some type of mapping here. This is a F I should have added. This is a function over the P of Z, X and Y that allows us to create the mapping. Um, these observations, there is some kind of more general results than that. Even if you don't have only observations, but you have a combination of experiments. Uh, this is a paper with Sangak and, and, uh, and Juan uh, that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, we got lucky. This was the best paper in the URI uh, last year. A very nice, fine piece of uh, work. Um, but it's exactly about the generality, about how to take data that is a different uh, modalities in some way in terms of these interventions. I'll, I'll talk more later. Um, but let me go back to the summary here. And I'm almost done with the first part. Uh, more two minutes, I think. Um, I talk about three different modalities. I talk about the online in which people is forgetting what's going on in the environment. It doesn't matter. I'll just go there, forget what is before. I'll just go there, submit the word to the policy pi. Pi is deciding the variable of x, or pi of c is deciding the variable of x. And I'll keep doing that a lot, and I'll sample from the system. This is called the online learning. Now you have a policy, um, uh, the off policy uh, method that uh, uh, here there is a policy that I was ongoing that was pi prime, that you have a do pi prime, that was picking the value of x, and you would like to understand how it will be the world uh, if you do pi x, the value of x is picked by pi, and we have this idea about using the IPW to flip things around and be able to compute it. It's contingent on the assumptions A1 and A2 that we already said about having the same action space, the same actions randomized, and having the same context uh, of the same perception. The two agents have to have the same perception. Now I have the modality three here, at least the basic version, that you said that we have observations from the environment. We don't know. It was not, this is what I mean, it was not deliberate uh, how people pick the action. Maybe, or they observe even the U, or or the U was, uh, uh, or they sit and on. Uh, apologies. Uh, uh, but we don't know, even in the subconscious level, perhaps the, X, the, the, the agent could be affected by X, but you don't observe the U. And you don't know the key word that I said at the time, we don't know the reasons for, for the for the action X. There's no randomization there, not controllability there. And we'll actually understand about what will be the effect when you control. The, the question for us here is like, do these strategies uh, always work? Do, do, do these strategies exhaust all the possibilities? I think this is the questions. Uh, more broadly, is learning in interactive systems uh, essentially done? Um, and I'll just mention a quick anecdote because I think I'm seven minutes uh, uh, behind. Um, I don't even know why what I said uh, more, but um, the, the the this view about is it learning in a, in interactive systems essentially done? That is this picture here. This means that all possible learning that we have in the world that are called about deep RL or whatever, you fit in one of these buckets. Now I get a quote uh, recently. I was in the week in the previous on watching interview of someone very prominent. Uh, entrepreneur and academic uh, and a team with uh, access to billions of dollars. And the person said, the, the interviewer said, I will not mention for sure, but the person said, oh, um, uh, what do you need to solve AI or, or, or what's going on? And and uh, and the person said, I don't know exactly what it needs, but uh, or how much time it will take was the question, but what does it need? And the person said, oh, what we need to solve AI is to scale things up. Uh, and if you keep doing that, and maybe we spend a few more billion, hopefully, th this is the, the quote, uh, I'm paraphrasing slightly, perhaps many, many more billions, uh, uh, but eventually we get there. Now, this is what I'm uh, asking here. Is it done, and you need a building like that with tons of PhDs in the best places and very uh, well, uh, uh, well paid? And we'll do more of the usual thing, and then it will be done because we'll be fitting one of these buckets, 
one of these buckets, or is there something else, some other modalities for learning that eventually uh, are needed? Um, and I, I think from the causal perspective, we know that more is needed. Uh, and the question is what is missing? Uh, and this is what I would like to talk later. Uh, what I'll do is the, I'll get the baby, the, the simplest possible examples that I can get in each of these modalities, and I'll show how things break up and how these are very important central ta central tasks in what CRL should be. Um, and, and, and we can discuss about how to scale this up. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the idea. Um, I, I think it's very exciting. Then, but the summary here of what we discussed, we discussed so far, I started with the, this RL picture, and I said that we, the, the, the two bullets is like, we have the, the environment that is modeled to the SCMM, and we define that as the object, and we have the agent that is modeled as a, a causal graph that is some type of model about the invariances of this environment. And now you have something that is the interaction between these two pieces, and then the PCH gives us a way about layer one, layer two, and layer three, about thinking about these different types of interactions. Here, I fit two, more prominently two types of interactions. That is layer two type of interaction. That is, we just focus on layer two, forget about layer one and layer three and keep doing experiments. This is layer two, layer two type of data. I, or we try to do some type of offline learning that in reality, we are trying to use from layer one of the other agent and see if we can predict the effect of our intervention that is layer two. Um, the, the, that's what you said. Now I would like to explore a little bit more and more, even more, more type of cross inference across the, the layers of the PCH. What could be other modalities? I think that's what I have so far. Um, and I'll come back soon. I'm, I'm available for questions, even though this is virtual, I guess, but I will be available. I guess, no, I'm sure. Uh, but I guess I will be available to answer uh, questions. Uh, thank you.